Now let us turn to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Just three sentences, but it will take us all our time this morning to get hold of the tremendous truths there are here. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we meet on this Whit Sunday morning to recall the pouring out of thy Holy Spirit upon those who were in one place with one accord praying for power. And we thank thee that of the many wonderful ministries which thy Holy Spirit enabled men to perform. One of them was the writing of this book. We thank thee that this book did not come through any private opinion or interpretation, but that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by thy Spirit, and that these words were in fact not just their words, but thine own word. We thank thee too that thy Holy Spirit enables men to read this book and to realize that it is thy truth. And we pray now that thy Holy Spirit may take of the things of Christ and make them real to us. We thank thee again for the amazing riches and unsearchable depths within thy word. And we pray now that thou will just take these words plant them deep within our hearts and enable every one of us to get something from the study this morning that will make thy power and thy righteousness more real to us. Especially we pray for any visitors and friends among us this morning who may not perhaps be used to this kind of service. We pray, O Lord, that thou will just help them to feel at home and that thou will speak to them in unmistakable tones and that they may rejoice to be with us and to be in thy presence and all this we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior Amen well now when we reach verses 21 to 26 of chapter 3 we've reached one of the most important passages in the whole of the letter to the Romans And some of the things people have said about this short section point to its significance and its importance. Somebody has said that the three verses we are to study this morning are the Magna Carta of our religion. And next time you go through Runnymede in the car and look at Magna Carta Island, you may remember our Magna Carta here. This is the foundation of our whole religion and of our salvation. Somebody else has said that this passage is the hinge on which the whole of the epistle and the whole of the gospel swings. So if you can imagine, it's something like this. Here's the hinge in the middle. The whole of it swings on that. Chapters 1 to 3 lead up to it. And then chapters 4 right to chapter 16 follow from it. And they all hinge around this little passage in chapter 3. You can also think of it not just as a hinge or the pivot of the gospel, but as a kind of mountain peak. Everything leading up to it, everything flowing down from it. And the two halves of the epistle, the part before this and the part after it, could be labeled like this. 
chapters 1 to 3 lead up to this passage by talking about sin. And we've been talking about sin for the last four studies. But chapters 4 to 16 don't talk about sin, they talk about salvation. And the reason is this. There's no point in telling people how to be cured until you tell them that they are sick. There's no point in offering people salvation until they know they've got sin. There's no point in telling them that Christ can do for them what they need if they don't feel that they need anything. And so we've spent chapters 1 to 3 diagnosing our disease, telling us that sin is our trouble and that we are under the judgment of God. Now when you realize that, you are desperate to know, is there any way out of this dilemma? Is there any cure? Is there any answer? And there is an answer. And we now reach that peak that describes the answer and then later explains it. I think at this point we'll have to have what's called nowadays a recap. And we'll just recapitulate what we've done so far. There are two major facts which so far have been discussed in Paul's letter to the Romans. Fact number one, God is our creator. That's the first fact of truth about our whole life and our whole universe. God is our creator. And everybody ought to know this because God has made it abundantly clear in the things he made that he made us. And that therefore everything we have and everything we are is owed to him. And we are to worship and thank him for this. There is no excuse for being an atheist or even an agnostic. Everybody ought to be a theist or a believer in God. Everybody should know that God is our creator and should thank him and worship him as such. If they enjoy anything he's made, they ought to thank him for it. If they look into the starry heavens or the blue sky of this morning, they ought to think of their creator and worship him and his greatness that he could make all this. But they don't. Men have given God up for their own religions, their own ideas, their own idols, their own images and imaginations. And because God, men have given God up for idolatry, God has given men up to immorality. And these two things go together. If we don't acknowledge the truth that God is our creator, sooner or later, morality suffers. Idolatry comes first. We have our own ideas about God and religion. Immorality follows. We get our own ideas about goodness and badness. And very soon things have gone badly wrong. Now that was all in chapter 1. Chapter 2 gave us another truth. God is not only our creator, God is our judge. And once again, everybody knows that. They either know it because they have read his law in the commandments, or they know it because they've read his law in their conscience. But either way, everybody in the world knows that there is a difference between right and wrong, and that one day right will be right and wrong will be wrong, and right will be rewarded and wrong punished. Everybody knows that. So here are the two basic truths. God is our creator and everybody knows that or should. God is our judge and whether from commandments or conscience everybody knows there's a law of right and wrong and that we shall be judged according to whether we've lived up to that law. As I said last time or the time before, God will only judge us according to what we knew of his law, of what we knew to be right or wrong. And if you've always lived up to what you know to be right, then you'll get to heaven and you're all right. If you've always lived up to what you knew of right and wrong. But the simple fact is, there is not one of us who has done. Not one. There isn't a soul in this congregation who could say, I have always done what I knew to be right. I have always lived up to the light I received. Now, I don't mind whether you've never heard about Christ or heard about him all your life. I don't mind whether you knew all the Ten Commandments or only knew one or two of them. It doesn't matter. The point is, we haven't lived up to what we did know. And that's enough to have us face God as judge and be found guilty. Now that's the problem. Here are the two facts. God is your creator. God is your judge. God made you and one day you'll stand before him to answer for whether you have lived up to the light you received. 
Now then that creates a gigantic problem. It means that every single man jack of us is guilty before God. How can he possibly take us to that perfect place called heaven? How can he possibly treat us as if we'd never broken any laws? How can he possibly do anything about it? Well, coming up fact number three. And fact number three occupies the rest of the epistle to the Romans and it's great news and it's this. God is our Savior. Now, without this, so far it's just been bad news and depressing and miserable and would tend to make you even worse than you were before. But now, the whole situation has changed. God is our creator, God is our judge, yes. But also, God is our Savior. And the rest of the epistle to the Romans is going to deal with this tremendous and wonderful truth. We notice that Paul begins by saying, but now, and those are crucial words. Whenever God says but, it's very, very important. And the word but always means that everything before it is cancelled out with what follows. There is a but at the beginning of Luke 24. Luke 23 describes the death and burial of Jesus and they all crept home broken, heartbroken, grieving people. And then Luke 24 begins, but on the first day of the week, there's one of God's buts. And you see, all the death of Christ is cancelled out in one but. All the burial, all the tragedy, all the dreadful end to the story is cancelled out. But, and we meet on the Sunday morning because that's God's but day. But on the first day of the week. Another but is found in Ephesians 2 where it says that we by nature are children of wrath, dead in trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy hath quickened us, made us alive, brought us back to himself. You see God's but again. Now here's one of God's buts. If God is my creator and God is my judge and that's all that there is to be said, I don't stand an earthly chance of ever getting heaven. If that is all the truth, then I would never even want to get anywhere near God. I would run from him. He would be a terror to me. And somebody who has only realized that God is creator and judge will feel just like that. But there's more. But now. Now what's so different about the now? It means that something has happened in history, something quite new, something has changed, something new has broken in, something has now happened that has altered that whole picture. And the answer is to be found in the simple fact that now, for the first time, this epistle starts talking about Jesus Christ. In the three sentences we're looking at, in every one the name Jesus occurs. That's the now. But now, what? What has happened to change this position? The answer is Jesus has come. And Jesus has died on a cross. That's it. We now live on the right side of the cross, but now something has happened. But now something has changed the situation. But now I need not fear God. But now I can find forgiveness. But now I can get out of God's court an innocent man. But now the righteousness of God has been revealed. But now. And the whole of the gospel is in those two words. But now. Since Jesus came, since Jesus died, the whole picture is altered. And in fact, the whole thing becomes good news and not bad news. Well, now, I could get very excited about this, and you can see I am doing. But Horace, the uh, Greek philosopher, used to say to Greek playwrights who were writing plays for the Greek theater, never bring a god onto the stage unless the problem is one that needs a god to solve it. And this was the guidance he gave to playwrights as they wrote plays for the Greek theatre. They were awfully fond of bringing a god onto the stage at a critical, crucial, uh, crucial or critical point in the play. Now he said, don't do this unless you've got the play into such a problem 
and the plot into such a complex situation that you need a God to solve it. Right. Martin Luther once said, quoting the words of Horace, that here was a problem big enough to call God in to solve. And this is precisely what has happened. Man could never have solved this problem. How can I solve the problem of the fact that I am guilty before God? Some people honestly think, you know, if you turn over a new leaf and do something good after you've done something bad, you've solved your problem. You haven't done anything of the sort. You maybe have stopped your debt to God growing. You maybe have stopped your guilt growing, but it hasn't wiped out the guilt that is there. And who can keep it up anyway? This is a problem that needed a God to solve it, and God solved it, and he has, but now he's put it right. That's just a simple way of talking of his righteousness. But now God has put it right. Well, now, how has he done this? This morning, of course, we can only look at three sentences, and they are the summary of how he did it. And in these three sentences, and I'm afraid we've had to use all the back of the board too, in the first sentence, but now his righteousness is revealed. In the second sentence, but now his grace is given. And in the third sentence, but now his perfection is proved. His righteousness is revealed, his grace is given, his perfection proved. And those three things are all happening in Jesus and in the death of Jesus. At the cross, these three things have happened. They didn't happen before, now they do. But now righteousness revealed, grace given, perfection proved. Now each of these three sentences is divided into two halves. Something about the past and something about the present. Past, present, past, present, past, present. And it goes on like that over the board too. And the past refers to the day of what we call the day of law, when God was only thought of as creator and judge. The present is thinking of what we call the gospel when we think primarily of God as Savior. It's the difference between the law of the past and the gospel of the present. And three times Paul draws a contrast between what happened under God's law in the past and what happens under his gospel in the present. So it's a very clear outline, very logical, and if you give your mind to it, I'm afraid there's just no answer to the logic of this passage. It proves that the whole situation has changed. Well, now let's take the first. The righteousness of God is now revealed. This was not true in the past. In the past, you were in a legal relationship to God. You had to keep his law if you wanted to get off. You had to keep all the commandments all your life if you wanted to be innocent. It was a legal relationship. But now God has found a new way of dealing with us, which is apart from the law. It's got nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. It's quite apart from that. Some people think that you've got to teach someone the Ten Commandments to make them a Christian. That's not true now. They can now be righteous before God without having heard of the Ten Commandments. They can be righteous before God without having heard of the law of God. It is apart from the law. It's not built on it. It's not the old law modified or adapted. Some people think that, ten, that Christianity is the Ten Commandments plus but it isn't. It's something new. The gospel is apart from the law. God is going to make us righteous, make us good in his sight, altogether apart from keeping the Ten Commandments or any other laws. Even following your conscience, God is going to make you righteous apart from all that. It's not directly related to it. And yet, and here's the paradoxical situation, and yet, if you go back to the old law and the prophets, you'll find that this new thing was there, hidden in it. It was witnessed to by the law and the prophets. Now, this is the amazing thing. From one point of view, the New Testament makes the Old Testament obsolete. It's apart from it. And yet from another point of view, when you understand the gospel in the New Testament and you read the Old again, there it is on every page. Isn't that astonishing? It's a kind of double relationship. 
It's apart from the law and yet it's witnessed to by the law. You read the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. And if you just read it in the old way, it just looks as if it says, now you keep these or else. You keep the commandments or else. You do these and you'll live. If you break them, you'll die. That's all you can see. But when you read the gospel and you understand the gospel, you go back to the first five books of the Bible and to your astonishment, you find the gospels everywhere in it. It's witnessed to there again and again and again. So there's a kind of double relationship between the law and the gospel. The gospel is something new apart from the law and yet the gospel is there in the law witnessed to by the law and the prophets. But you see the new basis. What is the new basis now on which God will accept you? It's not that you've lived a good life. It's not that you've kept the commandments. It's not that you've followed your conscience. What is it? But now the righteousness of God is revealed to people who have done what? Through faith in Jesus. That's all. Now let's look at this very carefully. I want you to notice the prepositions through, in, for. Very important this. It doesn't say anybody will ever be saved by faith. It says anybody can be saved through faith. Do you know the difference between through and by? It's very important. You'll never be saved by faith, but you can be saved through faith. Now what's the difference? I want you to imagine something now. I should have uh, brought something from my son's bedroom this morning. I want you to imagine that that's uh, a toy engine and here is a toy truck. See, this illustration is on the right lines. Well now, or to get on the right track. Well now, here's the truck, here's the engine. Now the truck needs to be moved along. It needs to get somewhere. And therefore it has hanging at the front a little chain called a coupling. And that coupling can link it up to that locomotive. And as soon as it does, the truck begins to move in the right direction. Now then, if I can say this, the coupling is faith. Faith doesn't pull the truck. The locomotive pulls the truck. But it was faith that enabled the locomotive to pull it. Have you got the point? And somebody who says, well, it's the coupling that pulls the truck is, is just not talking logically. But if somebody says it was through the coupling that the locomotive pulls the truck, then that's right. Now that truck could be coupled up to all sorts of other things. You could couple that truck up to another truck and people can couple their faith to other things. They can couple their faith to the church. They can couple their faith to a human being. They can couple their faith to their own good works. They can couple their faith to all sorts of things, to a stone idol. And you see, that doesn't shift them at all in the right direction. It doesn't move them. They've got faith, but it doesn't save them. Faith will only help if you couple that faith to the power that can move you. Now you see what Paul means. The righteousness of God, that's what I need. I'm unrighteous. I'm a bad man. He's good. I need his goodness. How do I get it? I couple up through faith. And his righteousness is now mine. His power is now mine. His wisdom is now mine. His salvation is now mine. Everything that he is is now mine. I'm coupled up through faith. My faith is that through which he pulls me in the right direction. Makes me what I ought to be. Now have you got the reason why the Bible doesn't say you're saved by faith. It says you're saved through faith. You need to be coupled up as soon as you're coupled up to the right person then that day you're righteous. Well then who do we couple up to? Some people think you should couple up to a church. As I've said, some people think you should couple up to a way of life or a system or a creed. But according to this, couple up to Jesus. One of Billy Graham's critics on the television this week said to him, I thought when you made the appeal you were asking me to fall in love with you. And I came out to respond to you, but anybody listening to Billy Graham carefully will know perfectly well that the last thing Billy Graham is doing is telling people to couple up to him. He's asking people to couple up to Christ, to put their faith in Jesus. 
Now the new basis on which God will accept a man as righteous is this. Through coupling up to Jesus. Through faith in Jesus. And if that's the new basis then frankly it is for all who will believe. And that means it's for any who will believe. It's as universal as that. After all the need is universal therefore the remedy is universal. After all we all need this. Therefore we can all have it. That's why there is this opportunity to all who believe. It is for all who believe, whether they're good or bad, rich or poor, religious or otherwise, black or white, Jew or Gentile. It makes no matter. It is for all who believe. Now that's the new basis of getting right with God. In the Old Testament the basis was do this and live. Keep the commandments and live. Follow your conscience and live. And that basis is no use to poor old me and it's no use to poor old you either. You'll never make it. But now the basis is quite different. The basis is you have faith in Jesus and you're coupled up to the righteousness of God. And his righteousness is big enough for you too. And he's prepared to give his to you. It's as if he says, I know you haven't any righteousness of your own. I know you're not good enough for me. But here, take mine. If you believe in Jesus, you've got my righteousness. And that's enough to cover all your unrighteousness. You know the hymn, and can it be that I should gain? Do you remember the line in it? Bold I approach the eternal throne that goes on clothed in righteousness divine. That's the simple good news. But now God says have mine through faith in Jesus for all who believe. Well I must move on. The second sentence in this short paragraph 21 to 26 goes on to say not only is his righteousness revealed. His grace is given now. Here we have a summary of chapters 1 to 3, a reminder that you need that grace desperately. A reminder that in fact two things may be said of everyone in the world. Men have all sorts of distinctions. I have mentioned some of them, Jew, Gentile, black, white, rich, poor, wise, simple. And I'm afraid men have the distinction good and bad. And so people say he was a good man, he's a bad man. He was better, he was worse. In God's sight, there is no such distinction. No one is any better or worse than anyone else. Now the amazing thing is that it's almost impossible for our human minds to understand how God looks at us. We look at each other and we say, well, so-and-so is better than so-and-so. And so-and-so, oh, far worse than this one. And we have a human distinction. In God's sight, it doesn't matter how wicked you are or how good you are. There is no distinction. Two things are true of you. And the first is, everyone has sinned. Everyone. There's no distinction. No one can claim exemption from that charge. No one can say that doesn't apply to me. There is no distinction at all. If you go into a prison, you may find that all the men and women in that prison have committed different crimes. But there is no distinction. They're all in prison. And they're all criminals. Now you might be interested in what they've done. And you might feel that one has done something worse than the other. But the simple fact is that when you went into that prison, you met everybody as prisoners and everybody as criminals they're all prisoners doesn't matter what they did whether it was big or little more or less they're all prisoners now that's how God looks at us he doesn't say have you committed worse sins than anybody else or have you managed fewer than anybody else he says you have sinned you've broken my law you're the same as the worst cannibal or criminal. You're just the same in my sight. Now, when will we realize this? Well, the sooner we get away from human distinctions and realize that in God's sight there's no distinction. 
You can't distinguish between good and bad in God's sight. Everybody's bad because everybody's done wrong. You see, the difference is not in degree or in kind. The difference is quite simply what you have done. Or to put it another way, Paul now goes on to say, it's the same thing to say that everybody's fallen short. Now, somebody in the congregation last night gave me a jolly good illustration of this, and they'll forgive me if I don't remember all the details correctly, but three men were in danger and to save their life they had to jump over a chasm and people were gathered to watch these three try and leap to safety from whatever danger they were in I don't know the details the first man was a very poor jumper and he just toppled over the edge and fell into the chasm below the second man did much better he got halfway but he fell into the same chasm and joined his companion the third man was an athlete, an Olympic jumper, and he took a tremendous flying leap and he failed by only six inches. But he fell into the same chasm with the other two. That's how God looks at things. Not how far you've jumped, but the simple fact is you fell short. God, when he made you, made you for his own glory and you've fallen short of that glory. It doesn't matter if you've fallen right down there or just back there. You fell short of his glory. You spoiled his purpose. You were not the person he meant you to be. He made you in his own image to reflect his glory, to live for his glory, to share his glory, to be glorified with him. He made you for that and insofar as our lives have fallen short of that. That's what matters. Now, some people may be poor jumpers. Do you know Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, was a great spiritual athlete. He was an Olympic Jew, if I can put it that way. And he went further in keeping the commandments than anyone else they knew at that time. Oh, he was a really good man, said the others. He kept all the laws. He did this, that, and the other. And yet he just fell short. And he knew that to fall short is to have been found wanting in God's sight. You see, you may have been 30% good, 60% good, 90% good. doesn't really matter. You fell short of God's glory. Now, that's the universal need. And the trouble is, under law, anything less than 100% is no good. Under law, you either keep the lot or none. Under God's law, if you break one link, you break the chain. Under God's law, if you offend in one point, you've become guilty of all. Under God's law, you've fallen short with anything less than perfection. Let's see what happens now under grace if under law we fall short every one of us and sin there are three things that sin has produced in our lives the falling short has produced and we've got to deal with these three things first the penalty we face secondly the power of sin which has got us in its grip and thirdly the pollution of sin what it's done to our character and our soul now, looking at those three things, the penalty, the power, and the pollution of sin at the top there, Paul now says, but now, now in the present, now in Jesus, through his death, three things are given to you, free gifts, which deal with these three things one by one. In relation to the penalty of sin, we are now justified freely by his grace. We are justified. Now, what does that word mean? It's a word from the law court, and it means acquitted. Case dismissed, this person is innocent. Under the law, I am guilty. Under the gospel, I am innocent. Once upon a time, I fell short. Now, God says, you are righteous. And you know, the amazing thing is that my goodness mark may be as low as 1%, and yet I can still be justified through the death of Jesus. So whatever percentage I managed, doesn't matter. I am freely justified. I'm acquitted from God's law court. That's the first great blessing. Can I put it this way? God says this, one day you're going to stand in my court. 
One day you're going to stand before me as judge. One day I will judge you on whether you fell short of what I planned for your life. Whether you fell short of what I revealed to you of my law. But this is what I'm going to do. I am prepared to take your case now. And I'm prepared to acquit you now. I'm prepared to dismiss the charge now. And I'm prepared to take into account not only all your past sins but all your future ones too. But I'm prepared to justify you now. We'll hold the court case now. And that will mean you'll never come into judgment later. Now that's what justification means. Isn't it wonderful? That God, the judge before whom everybody will one day stand and be found guilty, is prepared to say, I'm prepared to take your case now and pronounce you innocent and justify you. That'll deal with the penalty. Secondly, he says, I'm prepared to redeem you. And the word redemption now comes in. Do you know what that word means? I heard of a man when I was in Africa who went to a slave market and there are still 30,000 slaves a year sold in Africa. You may not know that, but there are. And he went to a slave market with his savings and he bought an African that he might set him free. And do you know what that would have been called in the Bible? It would have been called redemption. It means to buy somebody and set them free. Instead of a slave to make them a free man. And now we are told not only does God give us justification because of the death of Christ. He gives us redemption which means he sets us free from the power of sin. We're no longer a slave of it. He's prepared to break the chains. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. That's freedom. And in Romans chapter 6, he will develop that theme of being set free from sin, the power of it. Not just the penalty through justification, but the power through redemption. And now thirdly, the third blessing of today that is now available to us is another thing which term he now takes from the law court, from the temple. He took the word justification from the court, the word redemption from the market. Now he takes another word from the temple. Now I'm afraid we're up against a difficult word here. If you get a bit lost in the next two minutes, then turn off for a few minutes and come back again at about quarter to eleven. But there's a difficult word here and I'm afraid you will find it translated in various English ways. It's a Greek word, you don't need to bother with it, but if ever you see it mentioned in a book, the word is hilasterion. And of course the Bible was written in Greek, not English, and, and people have puzzled over what this word means. If you've got an authorized version in your hand at the moment, you'll see the word propitiation. If you've got a revised standard version at, in your hand at the moment, you'll see the word expiation. If you've got another version, you'll see the word mercy seat. Now what does it mean, this word hilasterion? It's the third blessing. Well, some people think it simply means expiation. Now that word in itself is not a word that many people know. What does it mean? It means simply wiping away dirt. Wiping away sin. Wiping the sheet clean. Clearing it off the balance. Taking the debit side away. That's expiation. And certainly that's one of the meanings of this word. It means to wipe something out as a debt is wiped out when it's been paid. Well, that's a good translation. But I'm not just entirely happy with it. How difficult it is to put some of these words into English. The next word that has been sometimes used, which I prefer, frankly, is the word propitiation. And that means to turn away someone's anger. To stop them being angry with you. To propitiate them. The only trouble is that usually has a kind of nasty tone of appeasing or placating someone. And of really dealing with a rather nasty person who if you bribe them will change their mind and attitude towards you. I'm not happy about that side because God isn't like that. And yet it is true that in the cross of Christ not only was sin wiped away but God's anger was turned away from us. And that's the truth in the word propitiation. 
but the third meaning is nearest of all. In the temple, as earlier in the tabernacle, in the middle room, the dark holy of holies, which no one ever saw except the high priest once a year, there was a great big piece of furniture, probably about the size of that table or even bigger. It was a big box made of shit and wood, covered with gold leaf, magnificent box, and inside were the Ten Commandments written on stone, Aaron's rod that budded, manna, a pot of manna, all sorts of things were inside that box. And then on top of the box there were angels, modeled, cherubim, seraphim. And then on the top of the box was one big square slab of pure gold. And it was called the mercy seat. And once a year the high priest went into the Holy of Holies carrying a vessel of blood. And when he got in, he sprinkled blood on the golden slab on the mercy seat. Once a year he did it on the Day of Atonement. Do you know what he was doing? He was cleansing the pollution of his nation for another year. He was turning away God's anger from Israel. He was wiping out the sins that they had committed. It was the mercy seat. It was the place where all these things happened through blood being sprinkled. That, of course, meant that a death had had to take place. That, of course, meant that animals had been killed and the blood of bulls and goats were used to do just this, to take away the pollution of it all, to cleanse the nation, and that's how it was done. Now, what Paul is saying is this. When Christ died, that was our mercy seat. We don't need a golden slab anymore. We now have it. A death took place, blood was shed, and through that blood at the cross, that is our mercy seat. That's where we get rid of the pollution of sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now that's difficult for us who are not used to sacrifice to understand. So perhaps the best word is the word propitiation. Turning away God's anger through the blood of Jesus Christ. The only contrast between that golden slab and the cross was this. The golden slab was in secret. The cross was set forth publicly. Everybody saw that. The golden slab was only seen once a year by the high priest. The cross and the shed blood of Jesus was seen by the whole multitude. That's our mercy seat. We have a mercy seat and when we go there, we find that there we have justification and the penalty of sin is dealt with. When we go to the cross, we find redemption and the power of sin is broken. And when we go to the cross, we find a propitiation that takes away the pollution of our wrongdoing from ourselves and cleanses us and makes us clean. Now that's the present blessing offered. And notice this, every one of those three things is something God had to provide. There's not one of us could have provided it. God had to justify, God had to redeem, God had to give the propitiation. Therefore, it is entirely free as a gift. It is, in biblical language, grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. And that's why now grace is given. God says, I offer you this freely. And yet, you know, the amazing thing is, people will accept anything free in any other sphere of life but religion. Bargains, gifts, they'll take them by the score. Offer them free salvation. Oh no. They want to contribute something to it. They want to atone for their own sins. They want to give something themselves. They want to be good enough. They want to try this and try that. And the tragedy is that God is offering them his free grace to justify, to redeem, to propitiate for them. And all of these things he's got to do, we can't, and yet they won't take it. I must rush on. The third sentence says that in all this God's perfection is proved. There are two things utterly wrong for any judge to do and they are these. First, to condemn the innocent and second, to acquit the guilty. 
How can God be just and yet acquit me, the unjust? How can God let off a sinner? How can God overlook my guilt? How can he do that and remain a judge and remain God and remain good? The answer is God is perfect justice, perfect mercy, and he's now proved it. It is true that under the law he did let people off and that was not right. It is true that he passed over sins in the Old Testament, that he forgave people in the Old Testament without a cross. And that was right because, as it says here, God was doing it because he looked forward to the day when he would punish their sins in Christ. Just as when he forgives me in the year 1966, he does it for the sake of something that happened 2,000 years ago, so he forgave David and Abraham for the sake of something that was going to happen hundreds of years ahead. At the cross, God was going to punish sin, so he was going to be just. And in fact, he has now proved that he is just and the justifier that he is perfectly just and merciful, that he punishes and pardons. When you look at the cross, it's the only place you'll see this in the whole of history. There is only one place where God is both just and merciful. All other places, he's one or the other. But at that place, he punishes and pardons all the sins of the world at one and the same time. He is both just and merciful. That's why, do you see, he could not have forgiven without the cross. And though he forgave before Christ died, and though he forgives after Christ has died, the cross is retrospective as well as prospective, backdated as well as postdated. Jesus was punished for the sins of the whole world, past and future. And therefore God is able to forgive and justify and yet remain absolutely just. Can I give you two illustrations of this which came out of my secular reading the last ten days? Here they are. First of all, in the Reader's Digest, this issue. There is the story of a young man who went to America on a student's allowance and he had to count every cent. He, he was very short of money. And lo and behold, within a few weeks of going there, he was driving a borrowed car down a road and he went straight over a halt sign, not being used to the traffic uh, situation in America. And a policeman stopped him and said, you, you've crossed that halt sign. I must give you a summons. And he wrote out the summons and the young man said, but I can't pay. I'm a student and I'm on a very small allowance. I haven't enough money to pay. And the policeman said, I can't help that, or the cop rather, said, I can't help that. I'm a representative of law and justice and you've broken the law. And he handed him a folded summons. The young man went home wondering what on earth he'd do. But when he got home and opened the summons, inside were seven dollars, which was the amount, the fine, of the fine for crossing a halt sign. The policeman had slipped them in. Now in that situation, justice and mercy were both perfectly exercised. The other one came from the Daily Express last week. A woman in court fined 50 pounds for a crime and she just could not pay. But nevertheless, the judge condemned her to that fine and said if she couldn't pay it, she must go to prison. And after he pronounced sentence, the judge took out his checkbook and wrote a check for 50 pounds and handed it to the woman. Now that was just and merciful. Have you got the picture? God says, I cannot overlook your sin, it must be punished. I cannot let you off, that would not be just. But here I provide with the summons my righteousness in Christ, if you'll have it. If you will believe in him, that's all I want. If you will couple up to Christ, I accept his righteousness instead of yours. I accept his death instead of yours. I accept him instead of you. Here it is. And God hands us his justice and his mercy at one and the same time. Now in the two illustrations I've given you, the woman and the young man could both have refused the offer. The young man could have sent the dollars back to the policeman and said, I don't want your charity. The woman could have said the same thing to the judge and torn up the check. And if they had done that, then the justice would have had to take its course and both would have been punished. You see how simple it is. God says, I offer you 
doesn't matter how wicked you think you've been or how good you think you are, you've fallen short. I summons you one day to my court. But because Christ has died and paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world, I am offering you my righteousness to meet my demands. In Christ, here it is, it's free, it's my grace, it's a gift. I will take your case now and justify you. I will break your chains of the slavery of sin and redeem you. I will give you a propitiation, a mercy seat where the pollution of your sin can be cleansed all away by the blood of my son. Will you take it? And you can see now that God could never have forgiven us without the blood of Jesus being shed. It would not have been just to let us off. It might have been mercy, but it would not have been just. God is now proved to be perfect. Now at the present time, says Paul, he is proved to be just and the justifier of him that hath faith in Jesus. Could anything be more wonderful or simpler or more logical or more clear? Yet the tragedy is that thousands still say, I don't want your charity. I don't want your forgiveness. I'm going to be good enough myself. I'll work my own passage to heaven. I'll be good enough. I'll do this, that and the other. The tragedy is refusing such an offer. Justice must take its course. And one day they will stand before their creator and their judge. God is our creator. Everybody knows that. And they should worship him as their creator and thank him as such. God is our judge. Everybody should know that there is a difference between right and wrong. And that God must punish us for doing wrong. But God is our savior and we want everyone to know that too. And to know that he has provided now in the present time because of Jesus and his death. Everything that the worst man on earth could possibly need to be absolutely righteous in God's sight. Now that's good news. That's the gospel which we are to preach, which Billy Graham will be preaching at Earl's Court, which pray God every church and preacher in the land ought to be preaching, and which alone is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we praise Thee because Thou art our Creator. We reverence thee because thou art our judge. But we love thee because thou art a saviour. We thank thee that even in the Old Testament thou art called a just God and a saviour. As one who is just and having salvation. And we are amazed at the way thou hast overcome the problem of how to take guilty sinners such as we into thy very heaven itself. Lord, we thank thee that in Jesus Christ and through his death we have all that we need. Grant that everyone here this morning may realize this, may believe it, may accept the free grace, the gift which thou art holding out to them. For we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.